So we are well on the way with the Allegro now. First job really was because we're gonna do so much, so many changes with the suspension and engine swap, almost everything running gear wise is gonna be different on this body shell. I wanted to make a proper jig um, to actually mount the car on so that, or mount the body on, so that it's really easy to like level and square everything off. Cut some of these blue bits down that are gonna go in the middle. I kind of already had some blue beam. I've got it all propped up on wooden blocks and I've done that so that it's kind of easy to shim it and tweak it when it's on the floor. When you're trying to make something big and flat like this on the floor, it only needs to have like one tiny bit of stone or pebble or something like that and it throws everything out of square. So if you put it up on wood, you've kind of only got two points of contact to actually try and level it on, which makes it so much easier. Um, wood's not the best thing, bits of box section would be better, but I ain't got enough offcuts, so I'm using wood. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna get all these bits cleaned up, all these joints, because I'm gonna weld these. Yeah, get it all squared and tacked together. That's probably gonna take the most amount of time, because this has to be, this is crucial that this is nice and square and flat, because this is like the main frame of the jig, so. I'm going to spend a bit of time doing that um, and then yeah I'll uh, I'll see how it goes welded up well from the top side I can't get up the underside obviously I could but it'd be much easier to weld it once it's flipped over fortunately we got a fork truck so this shouldn't be too difficult to uh, flip up and over before I do it I'm gonna get cutting the legs on the saw because it'll take quite a while to cut through because I've obviously got to cut like four or six so I'll get cutting those and I'm going to kind of play around with the height, what kind of height I want it at. I think I know, but again, advantage of using the fork truck is you can literally just put it at the height you think you want it at, try it out and uh, yeah, and then cut your legs. I've got some casters, um, as is the case when you order things like off eBay, kind of wanted like really heavy duty casters. Um, these don't look too bad, but they're not really, uh, they, they might not last, uh, well, realistically, this is just for moving the jig around on. It will actually sit on some legs. I've also got some some feet, some kind of wind down feet, so I can kind of uh, make sure that the car is flat at all times or the jig is flat at all times. I'll be able to level it on these feet, basically. Got like a, a winding screw. Um, so that goes in there and then you can kind of wind it down like level the, the jig bed out. I'm going to play around with um, getting the jig at the correct height, then I'll flip it over, weld it, we'll have the legs cut and then we can think about getting the Allegro on it. So I've got it flipped right the way over now and legs welded on it. Went for legs at 500 mil. Um, again, these can always be cut down. It's not the end of the world if I feel like it's too long, but I've got some off cut bits of plate that were I was using on the Princess to kind of uh, bodge all the back end up whilst I was chopping bits out of it. So I'm gonna repurpose those onto feet. They're not quite the right width, but Again, not, I'm not really that worried. Um, these are, the, the casters aren't ever really, I mean, they will bear weight, of course, but only really to move the car around. Once the car is in position, it's gonna be lowered onto these feet. Um, so I'm gonna have to have like a bolt-on bracket onto the side of the leg, which allows me to wind this foot up and take it off of the caster height. So that's the next thing, get these plates cleaned up drilled and tapped to take these casters um, and then think about what I'm going to do with this, this foot. OK, 
Okay, so this is what I came up with in the end. Just a bit of box section, a bit of angle welded on the end. And then my leveling foot will drop in and I can like wind it up and that takes it higher than the wheel is. Yeah, hopefully that'll do it. Next thing to do now, now that I've got them welded on all four corners, just flip it onto its wheels and get the Allegro on it. Okay, so we have skipped forward quite considerably now. Um, I'd obviously just rolled the jig under the car before. The next step really was getting two more beams to run in between the the kind of two parallel beams. It's like these are the, like then the horizontal beams and these are what the car will actually mount to. Um, again, there's a lot of critical measurements here because at this stage you've got to make sure you get everything millimeter perfect if you don't get it millimeter perfect you end up kind of you know chasing millimeters and squareness where you're never going to find it and it's because the car isn't on the jig in the correct position so it's a lot of measuring and a lot of tweaking a lot of kind of hammer tapping and things like that but for now I've got the beam um, just kind of uh, clamped on top of the two parallel beams and then I've made some feet which are um, kind of clamped onto the sill now this is this is probably the trickiest bit because um, obviously the car isn't necessarily as square as you think it is or as kind of flat and as level as you think it is you know just general build quality issues I guess but I've got it as square as I can possibly get it or as, or as I think I can get it um, and these are now bolted on and this section will then get welded down to this beam um, probably just tacked for now until we get a bit more until we get a bit further into the process but yeah the car is now fixed onto the jig um, I've taken the uh, wheels off and it's now a case of stripping all the uh, front suspension off and then actually kind of jigging and uh, fixturing those suspension locating points starting to do now is work out like we know what the wheelbase of the car is and what the track width is and I want to start adding bits onto the jig now which are going to accept that specific wheelbase and track width it'll become more obvious as I do it um, but because we're going to lose all of this front end of the car really the only thing we've got that defines where the wing goes um, is the is the front door edge back here because um, obviously you know you, 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 your wing will line up with the front door and then that defines where the wheel goes because it's got to sit in the middle of the wheel arch so we do know all that and I've been doing lots of working out and lots of uh, kind of measuring and this is where it becomes this super important that the jig is accurate because I can measure everything off the jig and I know the car is bang in the middle of it so any kind of um, any measurement I make for one side translates instantly to the other and I can mark everything off the center line and then not just a center line in the middle but then front to back as well so I can work out get the the, you know, the exact correct wheelbase and track width because of the route we're going to go which is like McPherson strut style setup you know the strut top position is crucial the lower arm position everything like that is all crucial because it's not so easily adjustable like it is with a double wishbone type setup so the only other complication we've got at this point once I've jigged up this lower arm position here so there's the original lower arm position which I will which I will jig um, and then the, the front tie bar position which we did back in July I'll jig that as well the only other thing that we've got to try and do something about if we can is and that is the wing position so the, originally the car was going to be um, split down to have a flip front and so the front panel and the wings were cut off now like when you kind of do that on minis what you do is you actually slice the full seam of the car off rather than drilling out all the spot welds you actually slice the full seam of the 
off the body. I'll show that in a minute. Um, and then that allows you to actually keep all of the strength in that front end and just hinge it on some brackets. Um, when these wings have been cut off, they have drilled out all of the spot welds. And because we're not painting this car, it's gonna make it really difficult to make it look right because the wings are full of holes. Whereas if we'd have kind of cut down that original inner wing under the seam, we'd just have a nice cut line, which we'd then be able to kind of add some bolt-on brackets to, and we wouldn't have a wing that's full of holes. Um, so I'll try and show that now and show like how I'm gonna have to, if I can, try and jig that position. I think it's almost gonna be more hassle than it's worth, purely because it's all so crumpled and bent and damaged that there's not really much accuracy left up there and I think what I'm going to be better off doing is kind of crossing that bridge later down the line and trying to kind of just use the doors to line the wings up the front panel and the bonnet all together it'll be a nightmare it's not going to be a fun job it's probably going to be the hardest aspect of the whole build to be honest because it's all it's all so mashed up you know it's it's a shame but yeah, like, so I'll try and show that now and show the challenge with that. Um, and yeah, then it's just on to doing a bit more jigging and then we can get with cutting the front end off, which will be exciting. Okay, so you can kind of see here all of the spot welds that have been drilled out of the wing. Um, and that's gonna, what, that's gonna be what really makes making a flip front here quite hard um, and making it look nice because we can't do anything about those holes really. Um, other than like fill them with sealer or something that's kind of body colored we can't really weld to this if we weld to this paint um we're gonna we're gonna ruin the paint finish so it's a tricky thing really you know it's going to be a case of you know trying to see and uh, just trying to do what's best we we can fill the holes in of course but it's never going to look quite as nice as if we just chop that seam off i'll show you what i mean now about just chopping the whole seam off so what you would try and do is this is where the wing was kind of welded on and this is where all the spot welds have been drilled out. Now what you would do, like with the Mini, if you were looking to make a flip front with the original front, is you would actually just cut off underneath here, kind of like all the way down here. And then what that does is it actually keeps all of the strength in the front end. And then you can kind of add on um, some brackets to kind of bolt it back together because you just have a, a cut line here and you can just have tabs which you just bolt on or your hinges or whatever, there's, there's tons of ways of doing it. But if you go and cut these and drill out these spot welds, you can't ever really fill in these holes without doing a lot of work. And of course we can't do that because on the wing, we aren't actually going to um, paint it. And you can see what I mean about it all being kind of bent and misshapen. It's very hard for me to kind of jig that position and know it's gonna be right because it's been banged around so much that it's just not really accurate like it should be anymore. So yeah, it's, it's gonna be a bit of a challenge. So what I've got in here is actually just a piece of box section um, with uh, a piece of tube in it and then a washer welded on either end, like a thick repair washer. And that's giving me like a, a location point then the bolt can go through which so this is kind of replicating what would be like the lower control arm um, and I've got that bolted in to the actual car and then I'm just going to use a piece of box section to go down from the car onto the jig basically um, so that again when I then cut the car away when I chop all this out uh, I've still got that fixed lower arm position to begin to construct new stuff from. So yeah, that's kind of how I've done that. Just kept it nice and simple. Um, so yeah, do that on both sides, weld it on, and then uh, onto the uh, front tie bar position. done basically exactly the same thing on these front tie bars as well um, again just on a piece of box section which is currently just clamped down to the jig I'm gonna try and resist welding anything to the jig just yet just because um, we may end up not using these positions that I'm jigging um, it just depends kind of 
what we think when we get the front chopped off and what it's like when I get those actual hub knuckles mounted. Um, I say I was thinking about kind of trying to jig the, um, the inner wing position so that the wings would line up, but I looked at it again and I just don't think it's going to be worth the time that I would have to spend to try and do it. Um, and we will keep these inner wing sections. I'm going to try and cut them off fairly surgically, um, and then you know it won't be too difficult given that we have jigged two fixture points on them, to actually put them back on the car if we wanted to, we would actually be able to kind of um, hopefully bolt this back on and it might line up with something if we needed to. I don't think we will. But yeah, I'm now at a stage where I'm about to basically cut the front off. So um, yeah, time to get chopping. level of inaccuracy now is going to translate to the inaccuracy in the suspension department really like on from there it's a case of jigging all the suspension points so first thing I did was put this beam through which I then kind of tied into the original lower arm position whether we end up using this yet I don't know because we, we could change it it's easier to get it now and not regret not having it in the future so yeah, like that's, that's all tied into this beam, both sides. And then the same with the um, tow link or the, um, the tie bar link. So yeah, we've also got that both sides as well. Again, just might not use it, but I'd rather have it and know that that's where the car originally, originally kind of mounted as such. Um, and then once I'd kind of got that in, it's just a case of chopping the inner wings off. And then that gives you, at that point, full freedom to do what you like with the car really. You don't want to go outside of the original wing position and original front panel position. Because obviously that's going to give you like a bodywork nightmare. But we've now got it to a point where all the suspension points are jigged. The, the kind of car body shell is bang on center. So then I kind of dropped the engine in, um, got it to the correct height to match what would be the height of the um, wheel at ride height. So again, this is like the next really important calculation. You need to know when the car is at its rolling ride height, so like when it's got weight in it, where do you want the wheel to be in the wheel arch? Do you want to have loads of ride height? Do you want to have no ride height at all? So have to kind of work that out, where you want the actual tire to sit in the wheel arch when the car is down the floor. And once you know that, you can then set that position or set that height. So for me, on this car, it was 225 mil from this beam that I'd put in to the wheel center. So that, once you know that, like that's where you actually want the car to ride at, that's the way you want your drive shaft level position to be. So you always want the drive shafts to be as level and as straight as possible, because obviously the front wheels are doing the turning and going up and down. So any kind of angle you induce, like as a static kind of ride height, if you have three degrees drive shaft angle as, as like a static, by the time you add, you know, steering input and suspension input, you are adding quite a lot of extra stress onto that CV joint. These are the things that are really important to think about at this stage because it's very hard to undo it or fix it later. So once I've fixed that wheel height, 225 mil, which is where I want the wheel to be based on where the car, car body is sat on the jig, you then run the drive shaft straight through and that sets the engine height. That way you know if the engine is sat at the correct height, which I've got it here on these, it's like 212 mil, basically 200 mil piece of box section and a 12 mil piece of ply. That sets the engine height at that point. So then I know that when the wheels are at the height we want them in relation to the wheel arch, the engine is in the correct position to have a completely parallel drive shaft. And that is like perfect. That's exactly what you want. But, it, but what it also begins to tell you at that point is how well the engine's gonna fit in the car. And this is kind of the big problem really, is that this engine really doesn't fit well. It's kind of hard to see without the front panel on. I've mocked it up, but the engine at the minute is super close to the bulkhead to get that perfect drive shaft angle. So we're not just talking about drive shaft angle in height, 
We're also talking about drive shaft angle in engine front to back. So if I demonstrated, um, you know, assuming this might be your drive shaft, if the engine was too high, your drive shaft would be at this angle. If your engine was too far back, your, engine, your drive shaft would be at that angle. You know, you, you can kind of really easily manipulate that and you want it to be as parallel, parallel and as flat as possible. So we can't really move the engine around too much without inducing that angle that we don't want. So it looks as though with this engine, the C27 engine that Johnny's kind of had for a long time, we would have to do some bulkhead mods because it's super close to the steering rack, which we can move. You know, we might have to move the steering rack anyway, but it's also really close for the exhaust manifold on the rear manifold. I just don't think we're gonna get this engine in this position or in what would be the perfect position without modifying the bulkhead. Modifying the bulkhead gives a whole nother kind of load of work in terms of then none of the interior remains original. That kind of is the challenge as to where we're at. So we've kind of been talking to Johnny about possible different engines. Um, K20 is one of them. So we had a chat about that um, and we're kind of at a point where we're kind of waiting for Johnny to make a decision really. I won't bore you with all the details, but not a lot has happened with this car in, in, the, in the last few years. Instead of setting everything around this engine and this transmission, because you would have to build the whole front around it, right? And you have to build the, the, the ECU, the induction. Front if, the if you would, yeah. At this stage, now is the time to think about a potentially a different engine because go any further than this and you're undoing more work that you've begun to do already. Yeah. And the reason why uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit sensitive is because A, I bought the donor car when it was worth nothing and the whole idea was to repurpose that donor car into the, into the Allegro. So there's that. And it's related to the car in so much it was a Rover, Austin Rover. B, there is a B. What's the B? Well, we've invested a lot of time in, you know, even just getting this engine cleaned up. We've got yeah. bearings and gaskets for it. Yeah. All things that were super hard to source. Yeah. That, yeah. you know, we, we, it would be well, a shame. Slip, yeah, it would be a shame to not use them, but there's yeah. just so many question marks around what this engine is, what it can do. Yeah. Can we get anyone to build it to a high-ish standard? You know, can we can we really use this engine the way we need to use it yeah. to make the car lively and fun and yeah. you know as drivable as you know you want it to be? The difficulty is, is that there's not a big aftermarket following. There's not a big following for this engine, certainly in the, the sort of the tuning world. So there's a lot of uncertainties, like you said. You don't know how far you can push it. You don't know how resilient it is. Nobody really turbos them. Hardly anyone supercharged them. And physically, it is a hard engine to get in you know, I didn't pick an easy engine to package. It's quite a wide V for a V6. Adam has got his, he's got a Jag 3 litre V6 down there from a, an S-Type. It's a significantly shallower V than that. So fitting the front panel on the car without any mods to the bonnet, without any mods visually to the valance and the grille and oh. So, so he goes, are you sure you want to do that? Because this, you know, with a lot of work, you might get 250, 260. Who knows? Yeah. Certainly you're not going to be much more than that out of this engine, with forced induction, that is. Or you could just use a different Honda engine, the K20, which you just happen to have lying around on a pallet. Uh, yeah, keep, keep a K20 or two in stock. The Never know when you might need. So, and on my knowledge of the K20 is not massively high. I know, I know it's got a, a huge following, and I know it's four cylinder, and I know it's VTEC. That's all I know, really. That's all you need to know. Reliable Honda. Hard to kill. Hard to kill. Um, they either sound great or bad, depending on your opinion. Yeah. Um, I'll blow it hot and cold in some they, they make so. the power, they're strong. Yeah. It's really hard to argue against the K20 in anything. You know, people, it's like when people swap RBs into something that had a 2JZ. Yeah. You go, well, why would you swap a, you know, it, it, that the K20 gives you that same kind of dilemma because it has so many things going for it yeah. that it's really hard to look past it as an engine swap engine because why would you not use it? it you know, two litre four cylinder makes all the power you're ever really going to expect from an engine of that size. 
So that's a more powerful engine than that. It's an easier engine to package, probably. You did definitely. Actually, you did mock that up in the engine bay of that with mm -hmm. the front panel. Yep. To show me the difference in packaging. Um, it, 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 I wouldn't say it's a, a ton different in terms of the front panel clearance. It's more that we gain so much extra room at the back of the engine for exhaust manifold and just in all other areas of the engine bay because we don't have that wide V6, really. And would you leave it normally aspirated or would you turbo it? Well, that's, it, it comes down to several things, I guess. It, it, it becomes levels down to- Levels of Yeah, yeah, levels of it. How much power do you want? How do you want it to drive? Yeah. Because, um, yeah, there's the option of the K24 bottom end, which will give it more torque. Uh, and that probably suits it as a naturally aspirated, really fast road car better. But again, even a K20 in stock form is really hard to, hard to argue with. You, I, I appreciate all of the reasons why the C27 is in that engine bay now. And that's why I left it in there because I, you know, I kind of wanted to show the challenges of, yeah. of why that engine is in there. Yeah. If we went for front cooling, that makes this part a lot easier. Yeah. It makes diagnosing any problems, it makes the weight lighter in so much as you haven't got water pipes delivering a high It's way point. less complication. Yeah. It, if you, yeah. putting your radiator in the back is not a bad idea, but it, it's, just, it's just something you don't need to do. It, you know, it's, it's excess. I'd rather keep everything up front, you know, in terms of, yeah. just becomes more of a normal car at that point, rather yeah. than a car with a radiator in the back, so which is pretty rare. Yeah. Chase any teething problems with. Damn it. So I'm, I'm, I'm really, I've got to make the decision before we can proceed. And it has to be made quite quick, really. What do we do? Do we do the V6 as was, the Rover 827 on the 2.7 motor? That doesn't have much in the way of aftermarket parts or following, but sounds great. And it's a good, good, good engine, but not, not a tuner engine. Or do you go K20 slash K24 on the, uh, tons more power, easily, every aftermarket. Reliability, you know exactly what it's going to do. Turbo or no turbo? Uh, thing is, uh, again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to talk anybody out of a C27. I totally understand all of the reasons for this engine. Yeah. Um, that's just an option that works better yeah. in basically every way. <laughs> I bought this engine in 2007 from a car that was scrap value pre recession. It was a long time ago, it was a different time. Um, so I do feel a, a, sen a sense of guilt about buying the Rover, a rare car now, and, and carving it up because nobody really wanted it. But we're at a point where I want the car, when it's built, to perform well. I want to be able to corner it well. I want it to be able to be slightly more future-proof, I suppose, in terms of tunability and options. To go, to go for more power in the future. Yeah. Which inevitably, people often want to do. Yeah. And there'll always be a, well, you don't really have that option with this. No. Or, or if you do, we don't know how far it can be pushed because no. there's no, there's not really any evidence of people pushing these, uh, certainly not in English speaking countries. No. So, that, so that's the situation. K20 or C27A, not ignore the jack motor. That's not in the equation. That's- We're not doing rear wheel drive Allegro. No, I did consider it back in 2007, but we, we, I wanted to keep this, a, remember the whole point of this car is basically a hot hatch. I wanted it to behave like a hot hatch, I wanted it to, to hand like a hot hatch. I wanted it to be light, feel light. Almost like a, a Civic Type R. Almost. Just missing I, the I, engine. I referenced Renault Sport when I was thinking about it, but you've got me into Honda. Okay. Shit, shit, shit. I hate that you need to <laughs> Other things we can start to think about well, before we know exactly which engine we're going to go with, again, is things like, once I've set the wheel position, I've actually got these laser cut plates, which I will bolt down to the jig. So this sets the wheel, at the, the wheel knuckle at the correct height. And from that, the knuckle is in basically the correct position. I can then, I can then zero degree on the caster so the caster is how much the shock absorber leans backwards or forwards. Really, you'd want some caster, you'd want some positive caster, so you'd want like the shock absorber to lean back a little bit. But given this car has actually got adjustable top mounts, we can actually um, add that in on the top mount. 
so we don't really need to worry about caster. Um, I might add like a couple of degrees, but it's hard to know exactly what effect that's going to have until you get the rest of the suspension geometry uh, kind of nailed down as well. So I'll probably just add in like a couple of degrees of caster and then that fixes the top mount position um, or the top mount position at what would be full droop because of course at the minute our wheel is at ride height but our suspension our shock absorber is at full droop because this is fully extended so as soon as we if we were to fix this top mount position now and then put the car on the floor the first thing that would happen is the shock absorber would just compress and then we'd have to like change the platform height so again there's a bit of working out to do here in knowing how much piston travel we want to leave for droop that's quite an important thing to get right then yeah then we can kind of know exactly about where we want to have that top mount how much travel we want to leave in that piston for droop we can then take the spring out allow the piston to come down and then add in a turret and a mount which we will kind of tie back to the bulkhead almost like temporarily or maybe even from the jig if i can because once i've done that i can then begin to start thinking about the lower arms um, and the tie bars and the mounts for those so at the minute we are kind of thinking that the car's probably not going to have a roll cage in it it might do but we're not 100 percent sure yet but there's going to be a lot of reinforcing to do in kind of in terms of like getting the um suspension back attached back to the bulkhead again so that's kind of where we're at with it really um i've kind of cut some uh, like box sections that i think will end up becoming tied to the bulkhead um, we may end up notching these for the gearbox depending on which engine we go with again we don't actually know that at the minute so we have got a couple of little hold ups but trying to kind of keep on with the progress so hopefully this has been a bit of a detailed description of what we're doing and why we're doing it and why i'm trying to be so methodical with it and it's because really the suspension geometry can actually make or break a car like anyone can kind of swap an engine in like the the inner wings that we chopped out are an example of that of anyone can kind of have a go at like cutting and chopping engine mounts but if you don't know if the engine's in the correct position and you're using hubs off a completely different car you don't know if the wheel's in the right position the car's never going to drive well it's there's, there's zero chance you're going to look out on getting all of these things like nailed right the first time so that's why it's really important to try and be quite calculated and do a lot of measuring making sure everything's as square as it could possibly be and you know just thinking about the process because if you want to have a really good result you know you can't just kind of suspend the engine in there and like weld some mounts and hope it's just hope it's right it, you know you say it's just almost never going to work but yeah Hopefully we'll be able to continue making some progress over the next few weeks and um, yeah, trying to film as much of it as we can. But yeah, any questions you've got, anything that you might want to know, again, I'm not necessarily an expert in this, but I know what I know um, and I'd be willing to kind of answer anything or go into detail a bit more on some, on some suspension related things. But yeah, thanks for watching.